Let me take you back and let's review where we've been the last uh, couple of weeks. For anybody that's new, then you'll get a chance to come right in to dovetail where you have missed. And, and for those of you who've been here, you'll go, oh yeah, oh yeah, I remember that. So we're going to talk about life's greatest battles. Then how do you go about fighting them uh, to the glory of God? But first, let's go back uh, to the globe and uh, let's just move from the United States uh, over on in the Middle East and zero in on the area of 1 Samuel 4, 5, 6, and 7. On the screen in the upper right-hand side, you see Shiloh there. And Shiloh was where the Ark of the Covenant was. And it was where Eli ministered with his two sons, Hophni and Phinehas. It's where Hannah prayed to the Lord, I can't have any children. God, would you open up my womb? And God opened up her womb. It's where uh, they divided the nation of Israel up into, hey, your family gets this much, and your family gets this much, and your family, remember there were, there, there were 12 tribes of the nation of Israel, so those, uh, they got their portions divided up at Shiloh. I told you that Ashdod, which is right on the Mediterranean there, uh, and Ekron and Gath, and below Ashdod, there would be Ekron, uh, Ashkelon and uh, Gaza. You've heard of the Gaza Strip. That's the area where the Philistines uh, were ruling at that time. And it's the area that they're still in charge of. It's just new faces, same generations of coming and wanting to be in charge. So they were spreading up the coast. And when they moved up the coast from Ashdod to Aphek, that's when Israel said, hey, wait a minute, this is our territory. Now, we're not going to change the Arab-Israeli conflict. The president of the United States is not going to solve that problem. The Camp David Accord under Jimmy Carter didn't solve that problem. Uh, all the way back in history, that problem has been going on. And it's going to be going on right up through the Battle of Armageddon, which is going to be fought in that territory as well, at the Valley of Megiddo. So it's, it's part of history. And the wonderful thing about uh, our faith and the Lord speaking to us from the word of God is we can go right down into these cities and these towns and find the, some of the artifacts and, and, and dig up the archaeology that was going on there. And it just verifies the word of God. And so God moved in history and he came and lived right where we can go and we can see these places and we can go on the Sea of Galilee and say, wow, Jesus was right here in the Sea of Galilee. He lived right here. It wasn't like, oh, this God didn't have anything to do with us. So when we go back here, let's start from Shiloh. The Jewish people left Shiloh and went over towards Aphek and said, hey, we need to protect our territory. This is the problem we have today in the Middle East. Jewish people are saying, who gave them this land? I didn't hear anybody. God did. God said, okay, I'm going to give you this land. Every place your foot's going to step, I'm going to give to you. And so they went and and had the territory. Other nations came along and fought against them, kicked them out. I want you to know that there are people that are Christians today that are Arab Christians. And they really have a little bit of a difficult time. Many of you know um, the, the godly girl that we had here in high school and she came to know the Lord and she went on and graduated from Master College, Amel. And Amel is from Tunisia and she is an Arab Christian. But she still has a little hard, difficult time because her family and her grandparents and people that are older, they keep saying, hey, Israel took this from us. Because Israel didn't have it from about 70 AD. Remember when Jerusalem was attacked and they fell? They didn't have it from then until 1948 when the Jewish people said, wait a minute. You know, let's go back. Let's start our own. This is the nation that God gave us. And then the Arabs said, wait a minute, you're taking this from us. And so now they're fighting over who had it first. That's why uh, I was thrilled years ago and that when the Camp David Accord was going on. And you remember when uh, Anmar Sadat was the president of Egypt? He was invited to speak in the Gennesset, which is the Congress of Israel. And you know what he said the very first thing? After he gave his welcome, he said, We are of our father Abraham. So what is he saying? 
Remember when Abraham, Abraham couldn't have any children and he didn't wait for God to give him a son? Abraham, you know, had a son, a son of promise. But before then, he had a son by a handmaiden. And that handmaiden and her children became the Arabs. If he'd have only obeyed God, all this conflict wouldn't have been there. Do you understand that? That's why when God says, you know, for instance, when you get married, stay there. Stay in that. And we understand there are times that, that uh, men have been abusive. I've sat down with men and I've said, if, if your wife, if you go at your wife again, I'm going to see that you're thrown in jail. Okay, so we don't, uh, abuse is not something that God anticipates. And so we will stand for protection. We're going to protect that woman. The husband is to love the wife like Christ loved the church. And hitting her is not doing that. And so we will we'll hold the, the reins. But God's word, here's the principle, let's obey it. Because why? He's wanting to protect us from having these wars and rumors of wars and all this conflict in the Middle East. So now, just like back then, they're going over trying to protect their territory. They fought against the Philistines at Aphek. By the way, just so you know, they went from Shiloh over to just shy of Aphek, right? About three miles shy to Ebenezer. They camped at Ebenezer, the Philistines camped at Aphek, and then they went into battle between those two areas. They lost 4,000 people the first time they fought. They came back and said, why? What happened? What did we do? Well, they've been living in sin, and we discovered that Hophni and Phinehas' sons were living in sin. They were supposed to be priests before the Lord, but when the women came to serve in the temple there, or in the tabernacle, they would sleep with them. Have sex with them. Sin right in the presence of God. So God was dealing with them. They lost that battle. So they said, let's go back to Shiloh. Let's pick up the ark of God. Let's take that into battle and God will have to fight for us because in the ark, this is God's special presence. But God said, no, you're not living for me. You're battling with me. So why should I go into battle and fight for you? They were fighting two battles. They were fighting the Philistines and they were fighting with God. And they weren't going to win either one. They decided to take the ark back into the battle. I said to you a few weeks back that they took the ark of God into battle, but they didn't take the God of the ark into battle. They took this furniture into battle and expected to win. It was only 45, it's a box. 45 inches long, 27 inches high, 27 inches deep. They're going to fight with a, with a piece of furniture. Kind of reminded me of when Mary Lynn Mueller uh, was still alive and she lived here one time. She saw this joke and she said, this is funny, look at this. The guy was going to, he died and he was going to go to heaven. And he asked, uh, obviously this is all made up, okay. And he, and he asked St. Peter, hey, can I take this to heaven? Oh, well, you can't take anything to heaven. He said, well, I, I got all, this, all these gold cubes. And, and can I just take them? And he said, okay, you can have one suitcase. So he, he packs it up, he dies, he goes to heaven, he's got his suitcase in hand. He stops off at the angel, and the angel opens the box, and the angel looks and says, what do you got in here? The angel opens the, the suitcase and says, pavement? What do you got pavement? The streets in heaven are gold. And the guy's got pavement? Why do you have pavement? These guys are coming into the battle, and they're taking furniture, how about God? God will go into the battle for you. But the ark of God? This is furniture. Now it's a wonderful picture and a representation of the mercy seat and all that kind of stuff. But you're going to... Remember when they went into battle, they said, let's take the ark of God and it will help us win. No, it will ever help you win. Later on in chapter 7 now, when they go into battle, they said, let's take the Lord in and he will fight the battle for us. They went over to Ebenezer and they lost. 4,000 people died the first time. 30,000 people died the second time and they lost the ark. When they lost the ark, it was a symbol of God's presence and his glory. 
and it was taken from Aphek down to Ashdod. When it was taken down to Ashdod, they put it in the temple of their idol, their foreign god named Dagon, D-A-G-O-N, Dagon. And you'll recall what happened. They had the Ark of the Covenant, and here's Dagon up on this uh, pedestal of some kind. And the next morning they came in, and the idol is on the floor, worshiping, as it were, the Ark of the Lord, fallen down. So they took the Ark, put it back in its place. We said, how funny it is that you can put, you can put their God in his place. Here, let me put you in your place. And so the next morning, second time, they come in, and this time the Ark is, uh, the ark is there, and the idol is on the floor again. This time, hands broken off, neck severed. And we said, it's a, it's a picture of the fact that their God has fallen and is dead before the God of Israel. We said, what happens when the arms are taken off? We told you that in battle, what did Israel and, bat- and, and armies do back then when they won the battle? They'd go through and cut what? Cut the hand off, the left hand off of the person so that they'd say, okay, this is how many people we've killed. They'd do one hand so that if somebody got confused and they, well, did you, oh, did, did this the same person? We got two hands on the same person? Mm-hmm. Left hand. That would indicate that. When somebody really died, you know, like David fought Goliath, he cut his head off. When Saul died in battle, the Philistines came and cut his head off. So here's this symbol, God just speaking to us right through their culture that their God is what? Dead. In Ashdod, this is what's going on. But in addition to that, they had a plague. A lot of mice, a lot of rats. People were getting tumors and dying. They said, get this ark out of Ashdod. Where can we send it? Ah, Let's send it to Gath. So they sent it from Ashdod over to Gath. I told you this is where Goliath grew up from Gath. When they got the ark at Gath, same thing happened. No more Dagon at that point. Tumors, plagues, mice, rats, death. They said, get this out of here. By the way, from Ashdod to Gath, then up to Ekron, all three of these cities had the same problem, a plague, death, rats, and mice. It took seven months to go this circuit. That's a lot of... It was just on the news just recently about rats and rats in New York City. And they they were actually saying that they're... Um, in the world, there's, X, I forget how many my, how many rats for every person alive. I mean, there's just rats everywhere. And in New York City, they're down in the sewage system and everything else. And you go, whoo. Can you imagine what it was like when you had no way of killing them off and it's just spreading everywhere? Every one of these cities said, get rid of the ark, get rid of the ark, get rid of the ark. The last time at Ekron, they said, let's, let's, let's just, uh, I don't want to take it back to them. That would be saying that we lost or that we somehow had to give in. So they said, they went to their um, the priests and deviners and they said, what should we do? They said, here's what you should do. Make, an, uh, make a, a cart that you can put the ark on, attach it to two milking cows, Let it go on its way and see if it goes back to Israel. If it doesn't, then it wasn't the Lord's hand against us. It was just something that happened. But if it does and it goes straight back to Israel, you'll know that it was God's hand against us. Oh, and by the way, don't send it back without any offering of some kind. They said, what kind of offering should we send? They said, "Uh, send back five gold tumors because that's what you had. So make tumors out of gold. And send back five gold uh, mice, rats kind of thing. And send it back as an offering to them. So now you got the cart that costs money. You got the cows that cost money. You got the gold. So what what do the Philistines do? They say, listen, when when that cart leaves here, follow it. We got gold there. 
And by the way, it wasn't just five gold tumors and five gold mice. The text actually says they, they sent five gold tumors, but they sent not only five gold uh, mice, but they sent one corresponding to every city and territory in Philistia. So more than they were asked to do, they did. So you got a lot of gold on the way to Beth Shemesh. So now they're going to let it go from Ekron, and it happens to go straight to Beth Shemesh, which is, by the way, the closest Jewish village to them, about seven miles away. Now, just so, you're, so you have some comprehension here, in a, we call it Beth Shemesh. Uh, the Jewish people would say it's, it's Beit Shemesh. Beit Shemesh. And as they go there, it is a cheap area of town. We say when it comes to the value of property, there are three things that are important, right? Say it. Location, location, location. Okay? If it's down on Wilshire Boulevard in L.A., it's worth more than your property up here. Right? This, Beth Shemesh, was right. It was the closest town to the enemy. Do you want your home right next to the enemy? Do you follow that? So the town that's closest to the enemy, the property, the property is what? Cheaper. Do you catch that? Remember when Joshua at the battle of Jericho? Where was Rahab's house? Right on the wall of Jericho. It was cheaper property. And by the way, what was Rahab's occupation? She was a prostitute. And so when people came in and out of the city, she could go, yoo And she would get money. If people attacked that city, which property got attacked first? The wall. And so that's cheaper property. Now, if Beth Shemesh is right on the border of the Philistine area, it's going to be cheaper property and people... Now you're going to let that cart go up there. You've got the cart that's valuable. You've got the two cows that are valuable. And you've got, come on, gold. There's gold in them their hills. So, let's, so the priest and the deviners of the Philistines say, follow the cart. Because if it doesn't go up there, we want the gold back. Does that make sense to you? So here they are. And what do the cows do? They go straight up to Beth Shemesh. Matter of fact, remember, they had to leave. They had two calves. And so they tied up the calves and kept them back there. And the calves are, are crying out for mama and, and milk. And the mamas are, are full of milk and saying, oh, I got to get rid of this. But they didn't stay with their young, which was the normal, natural thing to do. God took them right up to Beth Shemesh. And they said, wow, this is from the Lord. Now, we said in Beth Shemesh, let me get rid of, of all the Philistine area there for a moment and leave the couple of Jewish areas on there. Beth Shemesh, when it got to Beth Shemesh, they had problems with Beth Shemesh as well. Here are Jewish people there, but they're excited the ark is there. And they're so excited the ark is there that everybody goes, wow, I've never seen that before. When you haven't seen something and you know it's something that you're not supposed to see, if you tell somebody, don't look at it now, you, you say to little kids, look at this, I'm going to take my glasses off for a second. And little kids who have no glasses on, you know, they, they put their hands over there. We're going to ask you all, all to bow your heads and close your eyes. And what are they doing? <laughs> they're, they're looking around trying to see. And if you're told you, haven't, you can't get to the ark, what do you want to see? What's so important about it that I can't see it? And not only were they not supposed to uh, touch it, they weren't, supposed to, they weren't supposed to look inside it. And now what happened is those people got so excited. I mean, all of a sudden gold shows up, cows show up, a cart shows up, and they say, let's look at it. They looked inside the ark and God said, no, I told you don't do that. And he, and he struck those that looked inside, killed them. He said, look, I'm serious about this. When I tell you to do something, I want obedience. But they disobeyed God in so many ways at Beth Shemesh. Not only did they look in the ark, but when, they sh- when the ark showed up on the cart with the two cows, Israel said, wow, this is great. Let's just cut the cart apart. 
get a fire going, and then we'll sacrifice the two cows, milk cows, remember, because they had calves, and let's sacrifice them to the Lord. But did you know that God specifically in his word said, don't use milk cows, they use the bulls, of goats and calves. So they disobeyed God in offering something that they weren't supposed to offer. Secondly, they offered God something that cost them nothing. The writer of scripture says, I will not offer to the Lord that which cost me nothing. I want to say to you, I wonder if you have been obedient in that way. If you say, oh, yeah, I can do that. What what will it cost me? Oh, I don't know. I don't think I can do that. We sit around and try to give God that which cost us nothing. And then we wonder why God says, wow, how can I bless you when you, you aren't even willing to let go and let me have you, everything about you. So here's what happened. Men, people died in Beth Shemesh. Beth Shemesh says, let's get the ark out of here. Let's go. Where can we send it? Ah, there was a city just and a mile and a half away. Uh, you think it would be part of the same town, right? Let me put it on the screen. Here's Beth Shemesh. Right on the screen is Kiriath Jerem. And it's a mile and a half away. And so they said, let's tell the guys at Kiriath Jerem. They can have the ark. Now, it's a big deal to have the ark of God. So the men of Beth she- uh, Kiriath Jerem come down and get the ark and take it back. And it stays in Kiriath Jerem for 20 years. They appoint, they went to Abinadab's house and his son Eliezer was dedicated to the Lord and took care of it for 20 years. At the end of that 20 years, the people of Israel started to come to the, uh, seek the Lord. And they're, they're seeking after the Lord. And so, look at this screen. Samuel says, you're now seeking the Lord, so let me pray for you. I want you all to meet at Mizpah. And so Mizpah was just to the north of Jerusalem. Let's meet at Mizpah, and I'll be praying for you there. And that's where we are in today's text. Birth of Samuel through David's exile, we said, was kind of the statement that would help you remember what's in this whole book. There are 31 letters to this statement, and there are 31 chapters in the book. We told you to take one of these letters and put it for each chapter. So the B was the birth of Samuel. The I was immorality of Eli's sons. That's what's in chapter 2. And chapter 3 was revelation from God. Chapter 4, the ark was captured. Tragedy, the ark's captured. Chapter 5 was the hand of God at work. Last week I said to you, chapter 6... The letter O was obedience missing in Beth Shemesh. And I told you, I gave you, last last week I told you they looked in the ark. This week I told you, in addition to that, they also killed and sacrificed the animals that were inappropriate for the burnt offering. So were, were they obedient? No. And God dealt with them. Chapter 7, now they're back in another battle. And so let's put the F in chapter 7, fighting our battles with divine help. And so God began to help them in that battle. Now, so far uh, in the book of Samuel, you've had battle after battle after battle. Let's look at verse 1 of chapter 7. So the men of kiriath Jerem came for the ark of the Lord and took it to Abinadab's house on the hill. They consecrated his son Eliezer to take care of it. Time went by until 20 years had passed since the ark had been taken to kiriath Jerem. Then the whole house of Israel began to seek the Lord. Let me give you some idea of the impact of that statement. Now, Israel's small. But to say, and the whole house of Israel began to seek the Lord. If I could say to you, for some reason, the whole house of the United States began to seek the Lord. Wouldn't you say that's kind of a unique thing? Wow, America's turned back to God? Oh, America's... And all of a sudden, Israel's going back. After all, they'd been close to God, they'd fallen away. They'd been close to God, they'd fallen away. They'd been close to God, then all the nations around them had influence on them, they started to fall away. This is uh, Samuel 7, or verse 2. Verse 5 says it this way, Samuel said, Oh, you're seeking the Lord? Gather all Israel at Mizpah. What did I say happened? They were at Kirith-Jerim. 
than Mizpah, which is just north of Jerusalem. He says, gather all, the, all of Israel at Mizpah and I will pray to the Lord on your behalf. Verse 7 of the same chapter says it this way. When the Philistines heard that the Israelites had gathered at Mizpah, their rulers marched up toward Israel. When the Israelites heard about it, they were afraid because of the Philistines. They're going to have another battle. So far in 1 Samuel, they've had several battles. The first battle was against the Philistines. At where? Aphek. The second battle was against the Philistines. Where was the battle? I'll give you a clue. It's on the screen. At Aphek. Okay? Now, they lost the first battle. 4,000 died. They lost the second battle. 30,000 died. Now they're going to have another battle. Can you hear... uh, if our, if our American army and the Marines or one, one of the troops that we have, we said, hey, you're going to go to battle. And they said, oh, who are we going to fight against? And they said, uh, the Philistines. Oh, okay. So you go to battle and you, you win the battle or you, you're at the battle. The next time your general comes to you and says, hey, it's been 10 years. We've got another battle. And you say, oh, who are we going to fight this time? It's going to be the Moabites? Going to be the Ammonites? Going to be the Edomites? Who are we going to fight? No, it's going to be the Philistines. Wait a minute. Didn't we fight that once before? Yep. We fought once before. Ten years later, they say, hey, we're going to have another battle. Oh, who are we going to fight this time? Who, does it, who do they fight the third time? <laughs> Against the Philistines again. Can you see a pattern here? I told you when we opened up the, the, the book of Samuel, the Philistines are mentioned 150 times. In Samuel. I told you we have first and second Samuel now in our books. Originally, it was just one book. It, when they translated it, it had this big old scroll, and when they translated it down and, and started to make it more accessible, they broke it apart from Saul being king and David not quite coming on the kingship. And then chapter uh, second Samuel starts with David and goes from there on. So that's how they, they just broke the book apart into two parts. So now they're fighting against the Philistines again. Listen to me. Here's what I'd like to say. They fought the same people again and again and again. You have the same battles again and again and again. For some of you, you say, Dear God, I tell you what, God, I... I'm so sorry, I won't say that again about them. Lord, I've been gossiping about them. Lord, I want, I, you control my lips. Don't, don't, don't let me say it again. I want to, I really, I don't want you to do that. And then a month later, you're saying, oh God, I did it again. I, I told you I didn't want to do it again. You ever fought that same battle again and again? Some of you are saying, oh God, I, I don't want to lust. Oh God, I want to give it to you. I, I don't want to, I don't want to. And then a month later, you're, oh God, I'm back here again. What did they have to fight? The same nation again and again and again. This time though, so the first time they fought at Aphek, the second time they fought at Aphek, where'd they fight the third time? No, not Aphek. <laughs> okay, they fought it at Mizpah. Okay, so here's what I want to say to you. Look, like Israel... We face continuous battles in our lives. Do you think you got saved and you're never going to have another problem? I don't know about any. I, 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 I do know about you guys. You're just like me and just like everybody else. You trusted Christ and man, you grew in the Lord and then you had some speed bumps and you grew in the Lord and then you had some speed bumps. And That's why he says if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we say we do not sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth isn't in us. There is one denomination that said you reached a point of entire sanctification. Entire sanctification. Not just sanctification. Sanctification means that God sets you apart and you become holy in serving him. Entire sanctification, they taught, was you reach a place where you never sin again. And they went uh, based on Romans uh, chapter 7, where Paul said, oh, what I don't want to do, I do, and what I, you know, 
I said the struggle and then it ends with chapter 7 but thanks be to God who gives me the victory through our Lord Jesus Christ and they said that now he's entirely sanctified and he'll never sin again that's not what the text says this is the apostle Paul writing and what I don't want to do I do the only reason you have victory is in Christ I don't have victory but Christ has victory over sin and death so we face the same battles. Let me give you three. By the way, Israel won this battle. They lost the first one, 4,000 died. They lost the second one, 30,000 died. They won this one. Now what I'm saying to you is there are three steps that led to Israel's victory here. And the first step was genuine repentance. After all, if you are fighting against God and you are not repent, you're not repentant, You've got a battle against God and you've got a battle against the Philistines. But if you repent of your sins, now God says, okay, I'm going to battle for you. And it might be a battle. Oh, let me say this though. We got some kids here. Kids, just look at me. Okay? I got, this is just for you. Okay? Let me say it this way and I'll move over here and there's some kids over here. Let me say this. While you have continuous battles, your parents are never your battle. Satan would want you to think that your parents are problems. <laughs> Getting conviction by proxy over here. <laughs> Elbows. And your parents are never your battle. Don't let Satan make you think that, oh, my parents are the problem. Get on board with your parents and listen to them. Take their counsel. Let them say to you how much they've messed up because they have. If they want to be honest with you, they could say, I know, here's your sins, and here's one of mine. <laughs> but they, they don't ask your parents to do that. Just understand, they're not your battle. God says, children, obey your parents in the Lord, for this is well-pleasing to the Lord. They're, they're the ones that God's chosen for you. God says, honor your father and mother, which is the first commandment with promise. The promise is that your days may be long on the earth. So they're not the enemy. They're not the battle that you're facing. The most wonderful thing you could do is to submit to them. Someday you're going to leave them. For this reason shall a man leave his father and mother and cleave to his wife. But until then, learn that part of the battle is you learning submission so God can pour out his blessing. There'll come a time when the line gets drawn and you're in charge of your family. But until then, submit and be joyful about it. That wasn't part of the text, okay? Your parents can thank me later, okay? Genuine repentance. Let's go to the text. Verse 2. Time went by until 20 years had passed since the ark had been taken to kiriath Jerem. Then the whole house of Israel began to do what? Seek the Lord. This is wonderful. They're going to seek the Lord. Verse 3. Samuel told them, if you are returning to the Lord, by the way, just so you know, every translation, there's no question. He's saying, if, this is not a foregone conclusion. It, what he's saying here is this. Let's find out if your repentance is genuine. If you're going to seek the Lord, because Israel had said, oh, we'll seek the Lord. Oh, then we'll fall away. Oh, we'll seek the Lord. Oh, we'll fall away. Oh, we'll walk with the Lord. Oh, we'll... Up and down and up and down. He said, if you're going to seek the Lord, let's see if it's genuine. How am I going to know if it's genuine? If you are returning to the Lord with all your heart... Let me put this sentence on the screen and see if you can ascertain what I think out of those four words, which one's the important one? <laughs> In the last service, one lady said, scratched her head and said, well, let me, give, me some, give me a moment. Let me think about it. All. If I want to do it with all my heart. You know, there were people in the Word of God that God didn't have their heart at all. There were people in the Word of God that are said they had a divided heart. Saul had a divided heart. That's why he had so much disaster in the end. Not Samuel, Saul had a divided heart. When it came to David, though, and even though David sinned, remember what he said in Psalm 119, verses 9, 10, and 11? Wherewithal shall a young man cleanse his ways? By taking heed thereto according to thy word. 
with my, do you know what the next one is? With my whole heart have I sought thee. Oh, let me not wander from thy paths. Thy word have I hid in my heart that I might not sin against God. But what do you have? With my whole heart. Where have you heard this concept before? It's with all your heart. It's in Deuteronomy chapter 6 and verse 5. Love the Lord your God with all your heart and with all your soul and with all your strength. He said, if you're genuinely repentant, it's going to be this. Jesus said it this way when he repeated this phrase in Matthew chapter 22, verse 37. He said to him, love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. Oh, and one other thing, your neighbor, like yourself. Remember that? Here's this wonderful concept. Let's give God all of you. So how do I go about showing genuine repentance? I give God all of me. This is a quote by Dale Ralph Davis. He wrote one of the commentaries on on 1 Samuel. This is page 72. This is the illustration he talks about in repentance. Very short, but just a wonderful picture. Listen to it. During World War II, a worker in the French underground was able to enjoy auto travel all over France with no hindrance from the Germans. It was because some local French policeman put handcuffs on him. The German patrols uh, always thought him a a prisoner and paid no attention to him. They saw this guy and, and yet he was one of the leaders fighting against Germany. And he wouldn't have had access to any travel, but he got the handcuffs on and they carried him place to place and he had free access to everywhere. It says, repentance can sometimes masquerade like that. We take the tears or distress as infallible signs of repentance. Wow, he's he's really broken. He's really, he let him crying. Oh, he's really broken. He's distraught. Yeah, he's crying because he got caught. And he's distraught because he got caught, not because he did it. There's a difference. Yet people can be moved without being changed. Do you want to know the infallible sign that you are truly repentant? Is there change in your life? Or do you still wallow in the sin? If any man be in Christ, he is a new creation. Not a fixed up one. This is not God, uh, Bob Vila, in this old house. He's not not tearing the old things out and putting a a patch here and a patch there. And and you walk in and you go, wow. God said, let's let's get rid of the old. And I'm going to give you a new person. Brand new. The question I have for you, is there genuine repentance in your heart? Let's go back. This is uh, 1 Samuel Chapter 7, verse 3, from the New Living Translation. I don't use this, this, I don't know if you can call it a translation. Remember the Living Bible when it first came out? Living Bible is a paraphrase. So if you understand a a paraphrase is not going to be literal always. It's going to be good. And and if somebody says, let's say, uh, I don't know much about cars. And I'm going to tear the engine apart. And so, do I get the manual that's really detailed? Or since I don't know much about cars, if Bob says to me, hey, uh, yeah, it has a time, yeah, I think your timing belt broke. Now, uh, let me just explain to you how the timing belt works. It kind of, it's hooked on some gears, and it sends the, the pistons up and down, and I've already lost some of you. Because you say, I don't know, and, and I paraphrase it. So I say, look. Just suffice it to say, there was a chain that keeps everything in, the, in time. So this valve goes up and this valve goes up and it does it around this belt. When the belt breaks, the, the things stop going up and down and it doesn't fire and so you don't have any power and you're, you'll probably ruin your engine. And I just kind of paraphrase it. This is a paraphrase of 1 Samuel chapter 7, verse 3. It was paraphrased initially by Ken Taylor. Remember Ken Taylor? Ken used to be, uh, he used to work at Moody Bible Institute. He lived in Wheaton and he commuted on the train from Wheaton to Chicago. And every day he had eight kids and uh, they were 
oh, the ages at that time, 16 down to about two. And they would have devotions with their family. And when he was using the King James Version of the Bible, some of the kids were, and they were getting antsy. So here's what he did. Every day when he went to work, he took a section of scripture and he paraphrased it. And then he got home that night, he'd go in the morning, and then he'd give it to a couple of guys at work and say, hey, what do you think of this? Does it make it understandable? And, and am I being accurate to the text? And then he'd work on a little more going home that night. And then at night for devotions, they get all 10 of their family together and he'd read it. And he started with the epistles. But instead of epistles, he called them letters because they were letters from Paul to Timothy to Rome. And he would say, dear friends at Rome, this is Paul writing you from, and it sounded like a letter. And the kids went, wow, understood it. And so then he did the whole living Bible and did all that kind of stuff. And then he, now they're trying to make it into more of a translation than just a paraphrase. This is how it's worded in the New Living Translation. Then Samuel said to all the people of Israel, if you're really serious about wanting to return to the Lord. Now, is that what he said? He said, if you want your whole, give your whole heart. But in today's language, he says, let's dummy it down. And if you are really serious, I want you to genuinely repent. Let me go back to the same verse in the Christian Standard Bible. Samuel told them, if you are returning to the Lord with all your heart, if you are really serious, it's going to take what? All your heart. So you heard the difference there? So sometimes when you give, if you're doing something that you get your kids to understand, maybe you have both translations and you're, you're saying, hey, but you want them to really get the, the real translation. What's the real translation? It's with all your heart. And that means you're really serious. If you're really serious, if you're returning to the Lord with all your heart, there's three things that I want to see. One, get rid of the foreign gods and the Ashtoreths that are among you. Listen, repentance that's real will be God-focused and idol-smashing. So whatever the idol is in your life, whether it's your house, your job, your car, things that pull you away from God, your TV and all the wonderful things that you like to watch on there, I don't know what your idol is, but really true repentance, genuine repentance is going to be God-focused and idol-smashing. He said, get rid of the foreign gods and the Ashtaroths. By the way, just so you know, around them, the Philistines had Baal, they had Dagon, and they had the Ashtaroths. What were the Ashtaroths? They were the female gods. Because around their area, they were so promiscuous. They let everything in their religion. And so, sex was a part of that. And sex with anybody that was there. Dale Davis says it this way. Let me put it on the screen. Israel was to renounce both the male and female deities of the prevailing fertility worship. Because there were people that couldn't have babies. And they said, if you want to have a baby, pray to this idol. If you want to have a baby, pray to this tree. And you're going, what? What's what's that going to do? I need to pray to God. He goes on. Canaanite religion exerted a powerful appeal with sexual rites that were part of its worship. Most fun-loving Canaanites doubtless found the combination of liturgy and orgy highly congenial, not to speak of the convenience of having chapel and brothel at one location. Do you understand what they're doing there? I mean, you could go and have sex with anybody, and then you could go and worship, and it was all part of one. That's why Hophni and Phinehas had the problem they had. What were they doing at the tent of meeting? Sleeping with the women who were serving there. And so what had happened is just like Lot pitched his tent towards Sodom. You see, he left Sodom, but Sodom never left him. Do you understand the difference? And that's what was going on here. So he said, Get rid of these 
these false gods. Secondly, not only get rid of the gods, dedicate yourselves to the Lord. This is Romans 12, 1 and 2. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Dedicate your life to God. Thirdly, worship only Him. All the other religions said, oh, it doesn't matter if you worship just us. You can worship Baal, and you can worship Dagon, and you can worship the Ashtaroths. But not so with God, with Jehovah God. Worship how many? Only him. Here, O Israel, the Lord our God is one. And so we have one God. And he's exclusive. He said, nobody else can get to heaven any other way except by him. He, he said, I am the way, the truth, the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. That's why Christianity wants to win other people to the Lord. Because apart from that, they go to hell. Israel succeeded in this. For Samuel 7, 4. So the Israelites removed the Baals and the Ashtaroths and only worshiped the Lord. Wow. That's awesome. They did that first step. But they're going to still face a lot of battles. There are three steps that they had. The first one, they had genuine repentance. The second one is they had inter- intercessory prayer. You know, we ask you to pray for people. I'm wondering how much you really pray for others. God's word commands us to do it. He gives us the opportunity to participate with him in prayer for others. Look at what the text says. 1 Samuel 7, verses 5 and 6. Samuel said, Gather all, the, all Israel at Mizpah, and I will pray to the Lord on your behalf. Now remember, the Old Testament is just a sign, a shadow of something to come. Not very clear at times, so you're not sure what it is. But we know he's a priest, right? Samuel's a priest, he's a prophet and a priest, and he's serving the Lord there, and he's praying for others. Do we have a priest that prays for us? Yeah. And it becomes really clear, we have a great high priest. In the Old Testament, Samuel had to sleep. If he had to sleep, was he praying for you while he's sleeping? No, he's got to have sleep. Does Jesus ever have to sleep? No. He ever lives to make intercession for us. It goes on, verse 7. When the, the Philistines heard that the Israelites had gathered at Mizpah, their rulers marched up towards Israel. When the Israelites heard about it, they were afraid because of the Philistines. Verse 8. The Israelites said to Samuel, Don't stop crying out to the Lord our God for us. How different from chapter 4 where they said no prayer. Do you realize this is almost, I'll tell you in a second, this is almost the first time prayer has occurred in the book of Samuel. They've gone to two battles and no prayer. But not this time. They're desperate. What do they say? Don't stop crying to the Lord for us. He cried out to the Lord on behalf of Israel and the Lord answered him. Wow. Up to this point in the book of Samuel, only Hannah has prayed. Chapter 1, verse 10. Chapter 1, verse 12. Chapter 2, verse 1. Asking God for a child. And then praising him for getting a child. You'd have thought there'd been a lot of prayer. We've got seven chapters here. He cries out to the Lord for them. New Testament says it this way in Romans eight twenty six. In the same way, the Spirit also joins to help in our weakness. You have weakness, I have weakness. And who's going to help you in that weakness? The Holy Spirit. He's going to live in you. Because we do not know what to pray for as we should, but the Spirit himself does what? Got it? The Holy Spirit is praying for you with unspoken groanings. You know what it's like to groan when you're, oh God, oh God. I don't know what the Holy Spirit's groaning like, but he's unspoken groanings on your behalf. That's verse 26. Verse 27 says it this way. And he who searches the hearts knows the Spirit's mindset because he intercedes for the saints. Who are the saints? 
Hopefully you. Us. Anybody that's trusted Christ. Not somebody that's lived for all these years and then they died and then, then some conclave gets together and meets and makes them a saint. What did Paul write to the saints who are at Rome? Had they died? No, he's writing to living people. The Hagias, the holy ones, the ones that have given their lives to the Lord. This is Romans 8.27. Romans 8.34 says it this way. Who is the one who condemns? If I were to, this is like Paul going, he's looking right at you and he's saying, well, who's the one that's condemning you? Who's the one that condemns? And you go, let me think about it. Who, who's condemning me? Well, we know in Revelation that Satan is an accuser of the brethren. He, he wants to condemn you. But Paul says, who's the one that condemns you? Christ Jesus is the one who died. But even more has been raised. He also is at the right hand of God and does what? Man, he's interceding for us. He's saying, Father, I died for them. I love them. Father, I'm living in them. Father, I want to help them. Father, they've trusted me. Father, they're one of my children. And he's interceding for us. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 25 says it this way, Therefore, he, Christ, is always able to save those who come to God through him, since he always lives to intercede for them. Other priests like Samuel died. Eli died. Is Jesus going to die? He ever lives to make intercession. Is he ever going to sleep? No. Never going to die. Never going to sleep. He makes intercession for you and for me. If there was a statement that means the most to me out of this sermon, apart from the word of God, this statement is, nothing is quite so moving as knowing that I am a subject of Jesus' intercessory prayer. He knows your name. And can you imagine, do you think Jesus is wasting time praying for you? I mean, isn't it pretty amazing? He's praying for you. Let me give you an example of this, even while he was here on earth. Luke, Luke 22, verses 31 and 32. Jesus is speaking to Peter. Simon, Simon, look out. Satan is asked to sift you like wheat. But I have... He did it in this life. He's doing it in eternity. And he's praying for you. He's interceding on your behalf. You're going to have continuous battles. Israel took three steps that helped them in their battle. First, genuine repentance. Secondly, intercessory prayer. Third, divine help. They didn't fight the battle alone. God fought the battle. Who does the battle belong to? Anyway, the battle belongs to the the Lord. He knows the battles you're going to face. And if you're going to fight in yourself, you're going to lose. Here's what the text says. Verse 10. Samuel was offering the burnt offering as the Philistines drew near to fight against Israel. The Lord thundered loudly against the Philistines that day and threw them into such confusion that they fled before Israel. Now, can I just remind you what happened in chapter 4 when they brought the ark into battle? They were so excited. The ark's coming into battle. And Israel goes, Ah, it's great! And they thundered so loudly that God's word says that the ground shook. And the Philistines went, Ooh, they brought their God into the battle. This is the God that helped them in Egypt. And this is the God that... We're in trouble. But Israel lost. Because they bought furniture into the battle. They didn't bring God into the battle. Do you catch the difference? We sang, Come thou fount of every blessing, tune my heart to sing thy praise. The chorus said, uh, God of glory, voice of thunder, split the cedar, bring us under. It's taken from this. God thundered in the heavens. He sent them into derision. They didn't know what to do. When God fights your battle, you're going to win. When you fight the battle, you can make all the noise you want to make. 
And it's okay to say, Amen, Hallelujah, praise the Lord. You know, do all that. But if you don't love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with your only mind, if you're not taking these steps to face this battle, you've got him praying for you. He's wanting you to repent, genuine repentance. And then you've got him praying for you and you've got him fighting the battle. It is God who worketh in you, both to will and to do of his good pleasure. He said, I'm not going to just tell you what my will is. I'm going to do it for you. It's my will that you abstain from fornication. And I'm going to help you abstain from fornication. Does that? It does make sense. I hope it makes sense to you. The text goes on. Then the men of Israel charged out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines, striking them down all the way to a place below Bethkar. Verse 12, afterward. Samuel took a stone and set it upright between Mizpah and Shen. He named it what? Ebenezer. Explaining, this is what Ebenezer means, the Lord has helped us to this point. The Lord has helped us. You know, some of us, you need to put some more Ebenezers up in your life. You forget some of the victories you've had that God has given you. And you're just wallowing in defeat. And he said, look, I'm going to raise. That's why we sang, come thou fount of every blessing again this morning. See the word Ebenezer? He named it Ebenezer. The Lord has helped me to this point. Here are the words to one of the verses of come thou fount. Here I raise my Ebenezer. Hither by thy help I come. Catch it? But some people sing that and they think, what's my Ebenezer? Is that some old geezer? (laughs) Have I raised my sword? What have I done? No, this is just them placing something to remember that God has helped us. We do this all the time in cemeteries. We put stones there to remember this person's life. They live from this time to this time. And and some son will go back to that grave and say, Wow, this woman changed, helped change my life. This man had an influence on my life. We remember those victories. All I'm saying to you is, let's remember what God has done for us. Let's remember the way you've been changed. Let's remember the hope that you have when you go to battle. The question I have for you is this. Have you taken the steps that will ready you for battle? Battle, Genuine repentance? Rejoicing over intercessory prayer that God is doing on our behalf, the Holy Spirit's doing on our behalf, and that you are commanded to do for others? You can do this for missionaries. And for people, many of you said, oh, I've been praying for Audrey. She's going through this. And you're interceding. Let's pray. Oh, Heavenly Father, we know we face battles. And we know that we've had some real hard speed bumps at times. We thought we've gone out there in our own strength and we've lost. So we want to get close to you. We want to have your power. Father, we want to come to you today with all our hearts, with all our minds, with all our soul, with all our strength given to you. Perhaps there's some sin today you need to get rid of in your life. What is that sin? It's what you're thinking about right now where you've been battling again and again. And can you say, Lord... I, I want to have genuine repentance today. I would be ashamed if people knew that I, I've done this. But Lord, I want to realize I've hurt your heart more by doing this. Oh, Father, here's my heart. Take and seal it. Seal it for your courts above. 
that day we're with you. In Christ's name we pray. Amen.